Good evening. I'm Sonia Lips Rivera. I'm acting chair of the history department. I'm going to start us off. We have a couple of things to do before we start the lecture, a couple of introductions. But first, I, I would like to acknowledge that we are living and working on the unceded land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe uh, people. And as a history department, I think it's really important to acknowledge this history and acknowledge the uh, effects of colonialism that continue to, to permeate our institutions. On a happier note, the Shannons are a uh, long tradition in the history department. Um, and my colleague, Dominique Marshall, is going to speak uh, shortly after me to explain their genesis. And, and so I'm not going to say anything about them. Uh, in that way, except that they have been a really important part of the intellectual life of our department, uh, both inside the department and also with connections to other departments and other parts and, and to the city. It's a way to bring fresh new ideas to the history department and to the community and to our students, of course, and, and I'm very happy to see so many students here today. Now, of course, like so many other activities, uh, the pandemic kind of pushed the Shannons into a hibernation to some extent. And for the first time in decades, we weren't able to meet to to do the Shannons in person. We did have a, um, a ver an online version of, of these lectures. Uh, but now we're starting to venture out a little bit more at the university, a lot more in-person activities. And um, it's really, I think, crucial for these in-person activities to start for us to have a, a more vibrant intellectual life on the campus and at Dominion Chalmers and to engage in challenging uh, discussions. The Shannons have always been a way to explore the newest work of one corner of history and it allows to explore the linkages between Canadian history and what is going on in the historical work in many other parts of the world. And this year's theme is a quite a weighty one, climate histories. But although there's a lot of new and very exciting work on climate history, in a way historians have been doing climate history for a long time. They just maybe didn't know it was climate history. If you go back to the mid 20th century, the Annals School, are very famous, those of you in the history programs will probably have heard about the Annals School. Um, a lot of their early important works dealt with uh, climate, climate of it, change and the climate in history. Um, so this, this movement out of France uh, sort of radiated out to other parts of the world and many other historians of other parts of the world uh, looked at the way the climate affected uh, the price of corn, the harvest of grapes, things like that and how uh, this could even be linked to political upheaval and things like that. Um, so now we, of course, as you know, we face a global climate challenge and um, we, I think it's important for us to see how history can inform our understanding of past climatic change. Um, so an understanding of the past but also the present. So we're really lucky that my colleague Joanna Dean um, is so passionate about this topic and has assembled a stellar group of scholars for this lecture series, starting with uh, our, our speaker tonight. So it's a, a really big honor for me to welcome you to this first in-person, almost post-COVID Shannon lecture um, at this venue. And uh, at this point, I'm just going to introduce my colleague, Dominique Marshall who is the chair of the Shannon Committee, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about the history of the Shannons. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. A few words to thank the donor who made this series possible, Lois Long. It's the 21st year that this is happening every year. And Mrs. Long uh, uh, gave the donation that made this possible. She attended these, lecture, uh, these lectures religiously until she passed away four years ago. Uh, and her money is also used to finance um, graduate student travel all over the world. Uh, Lois Long's friendship and um, uh, uh, you could say collegial relation with our good uh, colleague, uh, retired Professor Bruce Elliott, also 
helped make that possible. She was uh, passionate about the history of Ireland, the history of genealogy, and social and local history. Um, thank you very much, and Joanna, up to you. We will get to the speaker, I promise you. <laughs> I'm just really excited to welcome you all tonight and to introduce Victoria Slanowski, who's our speaker. Very appropriately, our speaker, she's one of the first people in Canada to start of, of our generation to take historical climatology seriously. She told me when she first started studying at McGill in the 90s that um, people assumed if she was studying climatology, she was planning to be the weather girl on the TV station and had to explain that there were other things you could do with climatology, um, at which she has since gone on to show. Um, she studied in France and as well as in Canada. And she went on to write this book, which I hardly recommend, award-winning book, Climate in the Age of Empire, um, Weather Observations in Colonial Canada. And in the book, you'll be introduced to a number of very early climate observers and the extraordinary problems they encountered in trying to make their barometers and thermometers calibrate properly and survive the extreme cold and the difficult traveling conditions in Canada. So a fabulous story, not just about weather observations, but also about what people thought about climate and, and what they thought about the weather and what they thought was happening around them. Um, Victoria has also gone on to um, do a great deal of work in managing the data that lies behind this kind of climate history. She's currently leading the McGill's Data Rescue, Archives, and Weather Project called DRAW. She's the founding president of the Open Data Rescue um, Organization, and she leads the Canadian chapter of the Atmospheric Circulation Reconstruction Over the Earth, or she did lead it, uh, the ACRE Project. So she's not only written about climate and studied climate, but she's been working with a number of citizens and a very large interdisciplinary teams to try to put, put all the data, which comes in so many different forms and so many different ways, and to try to put it into a format that all of us historians can use in our work. And I think in future we'll be increasingly wanting any work that doesn't include climate will be missing a fairly large component. So I won't say anything more about her because I would like you to hear her for yourself, um, but very much like to welcome uh, Dr. Victoria Slanowski to speak to us. Well, thank you for that welcome and thank you for inviting me here today. It's an honor to be one of the speakers here at the Shannon Lectures and at the uh, History Department. Um, uh, it's it's wonderful to, to be here and to be here in person as we uh, try to slowly come out of our uh, three year, is it now? Uh, nearly uh, COVID uh, hibernation. Uh, and so I'm here to talk to you today about the history of weather observing and climatology in Canada. Now, in one sense, we have always been talking about our weather, especially our crazy weather in the last few weeks, few months, few years. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to decide where to put the endpoints or the starting points, but I'm mostly interested in numerical observations. So I'm going to start with um, some of the first, uh, can you see that at the end or is it coming off the edge of the page? Is, can, can you see the whole thing? Yep, okay. Um, so I'm gonna start with the first, some of the first systematic and long-term observations, which are those of uh, Jean-Francois Gauthier, which start in the 1740s. So Jean-Francois Gauthier was the médecin du roi in Quebec City. And here's an example for December of, let me check, December 1745. So his are some of the oldest original twice daily records of temperature measurements, along with weather, uh, precipitation, wind direction, and uh, general descriptions of the climate that have come down to us from the Southern Canada region. So Gauthier, uh, 
was integrated into one of the most sophisticated networks of science in the 18th century, uh, which is the scientific network that was coming out of Paris and France in the mid 18th century. So France was a real uh, scientific powerhouse uh, in the 18th century, especially, well, even after the revolution, but especially before the revolution. And one of the main centers was the Jardin de Bois or the Royal Botanical Gardens. So many doctors, Jean-François Gauthier was a doctor, received a lot of their education from the botanical regime or, or, or botanical world because most of the remedies were plant-based remedies. There were a few which were written about, which were metallurgically based remedies, which uh, sound kind of horrific, but most of them were based on plants. So, uh, so the people who, some of the people that Gauthier received his education from were botanists such as de Tournefort, de Vaillant, and the Jussier brothers. So the other main center for scientific observations, I, I'm using the word science. This is a bit anachronistic because at the time it wasn't called science. It was called either uh, natural history for botany or natural philosophy for things like astronomy, but I will, keep using science because it's a little bit easier for us modern ears. Um, so the other main center of scientific activity which concerns us in, in this story uh, here is the Paris Observatory. So the Paris Observatory was the center not only for astronomical observations, which we expect, but also for the measurements of the earth and also really just for measurements in general. So it was here that a lot of instruments were developed including things like thermometers, barometers, as well as the instruments that were used to measure the shape of the earth and other physical sciences. So I couldn't find a portrait of Gauthier, but instead here is a picture of L'Hôtel Dieu de Québec, which is where Gauthier undertook most of his work. So here's my representation for Gauthier. Uh, and Gauthier here is represented in the West, uh, in New France. Gauthier's main correspondent uh was his uh, he was officially appointed the correspondent of uh to the uh, Academy Royale des Sciences through uh Henri Louis uh Duhamel du Monceau. So almost all well not almost all but maybe 70%, 50 to 70% of Gauthier's observations were printed in the Memoir de l'Académie Royale de Sciences, which was the equivalent of, I don't know, nature science. It was very, very prestigious um, by his correspondent, uh, Duhamel du Monceau. So du Monceau was also very interested in both botany and meteorology and kept his own series of observations, which were also printed uh, in the Memoir de l'Académie Royale de Sciences. But Gauthier's work uh, with his temperature records uh, also led him in close correspondence with René Antoine de Réamur, and also with uh, Joseph Nicolas de Lille. So Réamur uh, is also a well-known botanist. He's most, he's actually much well better known for his botany than his thermometer, thermometry. But he published in 1732 uh, a very influential paper on how to construct thermometers and also how to make temperature measurements intercomparable between different sites and different types of thermometers, which might seem obvious, but is actually not not really very obvious. And so he sent uh, thermometers to Gauthier in New France, uh, as did De Lille. Now, the, the thermometers that were sent to New France by both Raimur and De Lille were not calibrated or were not graduated low enough to capture the cold temperatures of Quebec. So Gauthier would be trying to, to describe how cold it was, but all the mercury or alcohol, depending on the type of thermometer, would be contracted into the bulb. So it'd be saying things like, well, it's two grains of flax uh, contracted into the bulb, but I can't measure because, because there weren't numbers that were going down far enough to measure how cold it was. Uh, and so Delille took this very seriously. Delille was, was very, very interested, even more than Rayamur, in getting the scales right. So he took the manuscript observations of Gauthier and use them to construct new thermometers and put these uh, and kept the manuscript observations with his own papers. So a lot of the manuscript observations of, of, of records that were not published are kept with Delille's papers in the Paris Observatory. And that's how a lot of these observations have come down to us today through the archives of the Paris Observatory. Now, around the same time, uh, especially in the late 1740s, 
De la Galissonnaire, who was a captain in the French army, a naval captain, was appointed interim commandant of New France. And de la Galissonnaire was a very, very passionate natural historian and scientist. So he encouraged a lot of natural history uh, collecting and uh, other works in New France. Uh, and was a, a very encouraging of Gautier's work. And while he was there, uh, he was in contact also with some of the scientists in Sweden, such as uh, Linné or uh, Linnaeus, who I'm sure all history historians of, of science know. It's uh, thanks to, to Linnaeus, who was also a huge powerhouse of, of science in Sweden. Um, his, his work was absolutely phenomenal. And we still use the Linnaean system today to to name all the biological specimens with the two, two non, uh, nominators in Latin for each, um, each species. So Linnaeus' student, Calm, Pierre Calm, came to do, uh, did a well, natural scientist, mostly botanical, uh, tour of North America in the interest of trying to find um, specimens uh, from Quebec mostly that would grow in the cold Swedish climate. So he came to visit uh, North America, including Quebec, under the auspices of de la Galissonnaire, and it was Gautier who was his host. So it's thanks in large part to the diary that was kept by Calme that we know so much about Gautier and the state of science in New France uh, during this time, in the, the, the last years of the, uh, the French um, regime. So uh, in, in recognition of the work that Gautier did, uh, Linnaeus named a species of wintergreen berry after Gautier. So Gautier has his uh, little, little moments of uh, immortality, I guess, in the botanical region. And so finally, this, this kind of comes together a little bit. Uh, there isn't a direct connection between Celsius and Gautier, but the work that Gautier did, or the work that Gautier inspired with Raymer and Delisle, also went into the work of the Celsius thermometer because both um, Raymer and Delisle sent thermometers to Celsius, and Celsius worked with these thermometers to develop his scale. And his scale, of course, is the one that we use today as the international system, international uh, system for for degrees. Um, degrees Celsius. So here are some examples of the thermometers that Delisle and Raymond sent to Celsius that are kept in the Uppsala University. And we can see that these are the types of thermometers that also would have been sent to Gautier in the 1740s. So Gautier really, uh, well, I'll just go back to that. Uh, so Gautier, um, had an influence and the the measurements that were taken in Canada had an influence on the development of thermometry the the thermometers and the scales and the fluid the the type of liquid used in the thermometers these were all still very fluid uh, during this period and Gautier did participate in this development of thermometers and we can also see that Gautier was integrated into these networks it wasn't just somebody taking observations by himself he was integrated into these scientific networks. So Canada at the time was not, was already integrated into scientific networks, even in the 1740s. So, well, you're all history students, so you know um, what happened. Gautier died in 1756 while he was treating infectious soldiers. We can all appreciate the uh, impact of infectious diseases at the time. They had recently arrived in New France uh, during the Seven Years' War. And within the decade, uh, New France had fallen and was part of the British Empire. For the next several decades, there was a lot of turmoil going on. And it was some time before conditions were really settled enough for the kind of peacetime occupation, such as natural history or natural philosophy. So it wasn't really until the 1790s uh, that we have another long-term, I'm, I'm talking about long-term, I mean, there were short weather, weather observations and there were people who did keep weather observations, especially in the military, uh, but they tended to move around a lot. So we have fragmentary records and we think we may have come across some new sources, but um, the next ones that have really been uh, looked at in detail, analyzed in detail, are weather records that have been found in the Begill and McCord archives. So the next long-term one, which goes for over nearly 20 years, over 20 years, uh, 
uh, was kept by Reverend Alexander Spark in Quebec City, which starts in 1798. Uh, what other weather observers in Montreal was his colleague Alexander Skakel, who was a friend of Sparks and was a school teacher at a grammar school in Montreal. Although we think his weather records go back to the 1810s, so far we've only found a couple of fragments of Skakel's observations. Uh, but two of his pupils, including John Samuel McCord, uh, kept observations as well. Uh, so McCord's observations uh, are some of the earliest ones from Montreal, which start in 1813, and we'll have a look at his weather diary a little bit later. Uh, John Bethune, another clergyman, was uh, uh, rector and then dean at Christ Church in Montreal for nearly 40 years. He had a brief but uh, ill-fated tenure of uh, principal of McGill that did really not go over very well, but his weather observations are excellent and they form the backbone of uh, some of the uh, Montreal uh, observations for uh, the mid, early to mid 19th century. And another one of Skakel's students was a doctor, uh, Archibald Hall. Uh, there's a whole connection, which I will not get into here because we don't have time, between doctors, as we saw with Gautier, and weather observations. Uh, there was a lot of interest between medicine and meteorology. And finally, we have another doctor, Charles Smallwood, who built, completely built uh, his own observatory from homemade instruments, well, not completely homemade instruments, but some homemade instruments. And because he had a large medical practice and was often away from home, his observatory was largely automated, which was an incredible feat for the mid 19th century. And he later on became the, uh, founded the McGill Observatory and became the first professor of meteorology at McGill. So once again, I didn't animate this because we've kind of run out of time. Well, I thought we'd run out of time. But as with the French period, there were a lot of connections, not only with Europe in Scotland and in England, but with this, the United States as well, because now we're in a new century, we have the United States has, has uh, formed. Um, but both Spark and Skakel had connections in Scotland, and they were educated in Scotland in the late 18th century, which was the period of the Scottish Enlightenment. So once again, they were educated in one of the foremost um, educational places of the time. The Scotland was very well known for their strong commitment to education in the late 18th century during the Scottish Enlightenment. Hull was born in Montreal, but returned to, to Edinburgh for his medical education. At the time, the University of Edinburgh was known throughout Europe as one of the foremost places for um, medical education. Uh, McCord stayed in Montreal most of his life, but he formed a number of connections with uh, professors in Oxford, with the Royal Meteorological Society and the Royal Society in the UK, and also with colleagues in the US. He was a secretary of the Albany Institute. And Smallwood also formed a number of connections, uh, including with the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Joseph Henry was a very well-connected scientist, and he formed a network of volunteer Weather observers were volunteers from across Canada, uh, well, mostly the U.S., of course, but as well as the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and other places across North America would send a volunteer kept weather observations to Joseph Henry in order to try and understand the weather, the climate, and storm systems. So Smallwood was also very active in the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and in 1854 convinced them to come to Canada for their first meeting outside of the US. And although this was at a later period than uh, Smallwood and McCord, the scientists of the Natural History Society also convinced the British Association for the Advancement of Science to cross the ocean in 1884 and have their first meeting outside of Europe, well, outside the UK, in Montreal as well. So these were very persuasive scientists with lots of connections outside of Canada. So here's just a little pause from all these very busy slides to show a view of Montreal, which was painted by McCord's brother-in-law from McCord's uh, summer, summer retreat, where you can see what Montreal looked like in the 1840s, which is an awful lot smaller than it is now. <laughs> 
uh, and that's where most of the observers lived was in, in the city of Montreal. And you can also see a view of the St. Lawrence River and, and the St. Lawrence Valley, which is where uh, representative of what a lot of these observations, uh, the geography of a lot of these observations. So I'm going to talk, I was hoping it was gonna be brief, but it's probably not gonna be as brief as I was hoping about the founding of the Toronto Observatory because the Toronto Observatory is the, the founded, the, the precursor to the Meteorological Service of Canada, which I think uh, you'll hear about more in some of the next lectures, and is obviously the Canadian Center for Climate and Weather and Other Natural Hazard Observations, so it's a very important institution for Canada, so it's interesting a little bit to see the, the founding of it. So it was first meant to be founded in 1839, as part of a network of magnetical observations. So the meteorology, the weather observations were a secondary part of it. It was not the main um, point of these observatories. It was operated by the British Army, specifically the Royal Artillery, under the authority of Colonel Edward Sabine, who, who set up a network of four observatories under the British Army. Uh, the other three were in the Southern Hemisphere, and there were another four that were operated by the British East India Company in India. The other four, yes. Uh, so the officer in charge, the first officer in charge in getting the Toronto Observatory built was Charles Riddle. So he was uh, the founding officer, I suppose, of the observatory. And he had quite a task ahead of him to try and get an observatory built in a frontier town just after the 1838-1839 rebellions. Uh, he was sent home on sick leave in 1841, and John Henry Lefroy was appointed observatory director in his place, but Lefroy was sent on a tour of the Northwest uh, to collect magnetic observations close to the, North, uh, the magnetic North Pole. And so Charles Young husband was the interim director in his place. And I've been informed that because he was the interim director and not official director, we don't have a portrait of him. So here's a generic picture of a, an, a Royal Artillery officer that I, I found somewhere. So here is John Henry Lefroy. John Henry Lefroy was the director until 1853 when the British army was recalled out of well, home back to Britain. Uh, out of Canada, and the observatory became, was transferred to, to civil authority and became part of the University of Toronto. And uh, Professor George Kington was, uh, well, George Kington was appointed Professor of Meteorology and uh, remained the director of the observatory into the 1870s. So we have pictures of the directors. We do not have pictures of the uh, non-commissioned officers and lower ranks who are the, the gunners because they were artillery um, soldiers uh, who took most of the observations and did a lot of the calculations. So there were James Johnston, James Walker, Thomas Menzies, George Watson, Joseph Graham, Charles Jonas, who are the ones that are named in some of the correspondence. And some of these, especially Thomas Zen Menzies, stayed on in Canada after the army was uh, disbanded in Canada and became regular observers in the Meteorological Service of Canada and even had uh, children who followed them into the service. So the, as, as historians, you'll know the style of writing, uh, the letter books of the, observ uh, of the directors have been preserved in the uh, MSC archives. So Charles Riddle starts all his letters with, I have the honor and then continues to state that I consider the proposed position of the observ observatory objectionable. Uh, it took a lot of back and forth and going up and down the ranks and a lot of contention to get the observatory built. You can sort of see the map of, of York, as Toronto was in the background, and it wasn't very big, and it was surrounded by a lot of marshy land and otherwise marginal land. So the one of, well, this actually goes on for many more letters, but I've picked out a few of the highlights. So one of the first proposed uh, locations, and remember this was a magnetical observatory as well as a meteorological observatory, was to put it next to a drill ground where there'd be frequent firing of artillery and musketry guns right next to a bunch of magnetical um, equipment. So he was not too happy with that. The second location would be on swamps in the neighborhood, 
So again, uh, Charles Riddle said, no, I don't, I'm not too happy with this. At this point, his superior officers and the engineers are supposed to build the observatory are getting a little you know, annoyed with him. This is my personal favorite. It would be in rooms in some barracks that would be positioned between the lying in or maternity ward. And they would have to cross between the maternity ward every hour in order to reach the instrument room. I have to say, I've never been able to decide whether I would least prefer to be one of the people in the, one of the mothers in the maternity ward or one of the observers crossing between the observatory, the maternity ward in that position. And finally, after months of, uh, of letters, they agreed to build the observatory on the grounds belonging to the college, which later became the university. Although even there, there was danger and annoyance from shooting matches. And one afternoon, they had five charges which passed through the observatory windows in one afternoon. So weather observing was apparently not for the faint of heart in Toronto. So here we just have some pictures from the reconstruction in Fort York of what it was like to be an NCO versus what it was like to be an officer. NCOs, they had uh, four men or one family uh, to one bunk uh, versus the officers who had all their dining equipment shipped out to them and, uh, and luxury dining rooms. And uh, a picture of a writing desk where a lot of these letters would have been written that tell us about the daily life in the observatory. And so once again, I won't go through all the details of this, but uh, there were connections both between the, the military observers and the civil observers in Canada, between Quebec, Montreal, and Toronto. Uh, McCord and some of the observers who were connected in Quebec were some of the linchpins in this communications. And as we can expect, um, because they were military observers, these soldier scientists had connections obviously within the army and within the British establishment, but they also had connections with the civil society through the uh, British Association for Advancement of Science, the Royal Society, the Royal Meteorological Society. Um, I won't get into this, but a lot of the driving force behind the Magnetic Crusade, as it was called, was Alexander von Humboldt, who was very interested in trying to find a unifying force between all the sciences. But the... Um, the, the officers behind the, the Toronto Magnetical Observatory were also very interested in forming connections in the US. So every time they traveled across the Atlantic, they tried to travel through the US so that they could make connections with American scientists, especially uh, as we saw earlier, uh, Joseph Henry at the Smithsonian. So a lot of these observations have also been duplicated in uh, the National Archives and Records Administration in the US. So that is the social connections part of this talk. Um, one of the things that I found interesting in going through a lot of these records was to find a lot of references to climate change, uh, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. Now, again, there's a whole history and historiography about climate change. Uh, there's a lot that's been written about this, including by some of the other speakers. Um, but I was coming at this from a, a scientific point of view. So I was interested in evaluating the ideas behind the science, behind the climate change uh, and to see how they, they stood up scientifically. Um, but I, this was not really something I was expecting to see so much uh, as I was looking through for the observations. So even as, as far back as the 18th century, Gauthier is mentioning the idea, not just of climate change, but of human caused climate change in his letters. And all, another thing that I found interesting is that it, this is not something that's coming from the scientists. This is something that Gauthier is reporting, hearing about coming from the popular opinion, coming from the people. So he, he, he says the, the inhabitants of Canada, the habitants du Canada, uh, claim, I mean, I, I translated the word prétend as claim, um, that the winters are not as harsh as they used to be. And this they attribute to the large quantity of land which has been cleared. So this is gone under various names. There's a, some call it the climate improvement theory. Some call it the, the cultivation, the clearing and cultivation theory. And this had been around, well, it, it's been around in various guises since the ancient Greeks. Greeks, it's sort of come and gone throughout the history, uh, well, throughout Western history, the history of Western thought. But this had been particularly prevalent in colonial history, uh, especially. 
So here we see, even Samuel de Champlain mentioned it, but here we see it really uh, mentioned in connection with observations. And we see also that Gauthier is not really endorsing it, like he's distancing himself a little bit from it. Um, so it, it, it's sort of interesting to see this. So, so I don't know how much you, you know about this, but the, the theory here is that by modifying the environment, by modifying the landscape, we can modify the climate. And this has been, it wasn't, it was written about as early as 1745. I had not, I'm not uh, a historian in this particularly, other people have written about this. Um, but it was interesting to see it being reported back to France by Gauthier in the 1740s. It sort of was still being written about, especially in the US uh, in the 18th century. And then it's still around even, um, even in the 19th century. So here, uh, George Young, who's the editor of the Nova Scotian is talking about it as well. This is not really from a scientific perspective, but this shows how prevalent it is in, um, in popular thinking. So we're satisfied that the opinion of climate warming is correct, but at the same time, it would be more satisfactory to refer to actual observations. So this is some of the impetus behind people, some of the people's keeping of climatic records is that some of it is for utilitarian purposes, some of it's for medical purposes, but some of it is actually for climatic purposes. They want to know if the climate is changing. So Kelly, who we just, uh, saw very briefly in one of the, the um, slides before. He was a naval surgeon who was part of Bonnie Castle's uh, surveying group. They were surveying the uh, Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence and part of the North Atlantic. Discusses also that the general opinion is that the climate of a country becomes milder as it is cleared of forests and cultivated. Kelly was a complete skeptic of this theory. He went back and looked at records going all the way back to Samuel de Champlain, and he probably looked back at records of Gauthier, although he does not mention him specifically, and pretty much says, no, there has been no change of climate. We still see snows at the same date and, and other things like that. So he, um, Kelly was not a fan of this theory. McCord, uh, McCord says he had not made up his mind as to the fact of climate being materially altered, but was impressed generally with the belief that the climate had become warmer as it increased in population and cultivation. And this is more than any anyone else. McCord was really interested in this theory. McCord collected, kept not only his own records, but collected records of other people. And this is why in the McCord Museum archives, we have such a collection now of climatic records. And it's because of McCord's interest in this question that we are now able to reconstruct the climate of the late 18th and um, 19th centuries is because of McCord's interest in trying to find out if the climate had changed. And even Lefroy is trying to, to again, Lefroy's main interest was in magnetic observations under weather observations, but he is also interested in this question and saying by reference to the observations, we can learn whether we can bring about changes in climate through human agency. So, so this is a, a question which has very deep roots uh, in Canadian history and Canadian weather observations. All right, so we have some of the motivations. We know some of the characters. Now, can we have a look at the data? So, when you look at a page like this, it does not immediately inspire an awful lot of confidence, especially if we think of the streams of data output that we now get from automatic weather stations and things like that. So this is the first page of the document I was mentioning earlier of the McCord Weather Diary that was started in 1813. In 1813, McCord, John Samuel McCord would have been about 11. So, I obviously can't prove this, but I think this was something along the lines of an assignment or a science fair project or something like that. That was assigned to McCord by Alexander Skakel when he was a pupil, uh, judging by the handwriting and judging by the sort of blots and, uh, and, and et cetera on this paper, on this page. But uh, it goes till 1826. It's got a few, at least two different types of handwriting in it. So I suspect the document as a whole was kept by both John Samuel McCord and his father Thomas McCord because it continues when we know John Samuel was away at school um, in both Montreal and Quebec City 
where he was taught by uh, by Alexander Skakel's people, Daniel Bilkey. There are so many connections between, I mean, these are not large communities. So there are a lot of connections between all the people here. So, okay, we we're just kind of looking at this and we say, all right, well, let's have a look. What can we do with this data? So it's the observations were kept around 8, 8 a.m. and uh, 2 or 3 p.m. So the first thing to do is have a look at the data. So here are all the 8 a.m. observations from that document. And one of the things that stands out immediately is there are a lot more even observations and odd observations. So when we have a look through the McCord Museum uh, um, artifacts, we can see that they, they have a thermometer. Oh, it's, an, it's kept in Fahrenheit degrees, I should say, which is graduated uh, to uh, two degrees Fahrenheit two degrees Fahrenheit on one side. The other graduation, interestingly, is Raymer degrees. So they're not using uh, Celsius or, or other degrees. And so we can say, well, this is typical of thermometers at the time. It was graduated in Fahrenheit and it's graduated to every two degrees. So this kind of confirms a little bit what we see in the data. Um, and here we go. Uh, if we transform it to Celsius degrees and then we compare it to modern data, in those black dashed lines, we can see uh, observations at 8 a.m. from the Montreal Dorval Airport. And actually, uh, I did not expect to see this, but they match amazingly well. So they are measuring the same phenomena. Um, they match up. And I, I this is not a technical talk, so I did not show this, but there are cases where they do not match at all. And then we find something in the, uh, observe, uh, in, in the record saying, oh, hmm. The thermometer was in the sun. Maybe I should move it, or or something similar. So so it's not. We we do see cases where this doesn't work, but uh, there are many cases where actually the observations, the historical observations, do match up really well with the um, with the modern observations. So we can see that they are measuring uh, the same phenomena overall. And we can sometimes sometimes I made a mistake and I I compared the minimum observations or the 7 a.m. observations or something like that. And right away, you can see the shift. So it is actually quite a precise measuring technique. So once we can be confident in our measurements, we can be confident that they're, they are actually measuring uh, the same phenomena, we can start looking at these observations and, and seeing what they tell us about the climate. So here uh, is a graph of the winter minimum temperatures. Uh, I'm defining winter here as November through March because that's what it is kind of in Canada or was. Um, and we can see that the winters are definitely getting warmer or or less cold. I mean, both. They're both getting warmer and less cold because we don't have the really cold winters that we had before. And we are getting hitting some winters, especially recent times, that are warmer than they used to be. But even with that, we also see that we have variability in the winters. It's not like a complete trend upwards. So we have periods in the 1870s and 1880s that were cold, and then we sort of have a warming trend until the 1950s, and then we have another dip again, and then we have another warming trend. So it's so we so even within the warming trend that we see going on since you know the 1870s, there are periods of relative warmth and relative relative cold. The summer maximum temperatures are kind of more interesting because they don't show the story we kind of might expect. They're a lot flatter. So this is the highest temperature of the day um, and for June, July, August. And we see um, kind of not, not exactly what we'd expect. We see there's some, some warm temperatures in the early part of the 19th century. And there is some up and down um, and it is warmer more recently, but not as dramatically as we saw with the, the minimum temperatures. So we can also look, because, because these weather records are, are fairly complete, we can also look at the, the kind of descriptions, things like snow, wind, snowstorm, blizzard, things like that. So here's just an example of what we can start to look at with these weather records. We can look at things like snowstorm days, and we can see how snowstorm days have changed. And again, we can see there's kind of a general trend to fewer snowstorm days. Uh, but it's, again, it's up and down and there's quite a large spread. So there's some years where there are few snowstorms and some years where there are just, you know, uh, day after day, huge numbers of snowstorms. 
So with this, we can kind of look at things like natural hazards. You can look at things like um, how how social how how we have social responses to snowstorms. How do people cope with them? Are there differences in our vulnerabilities? Are we more vulnerable now because we have a lot more electrification, which can be are we more dependent on certain things? Are we less dependent on certain things? How does heating, how are we impacted by heating? How are we impact, you know, there, there are a lot more, there are different questions and we can look at how people respond differently um, to things like snowstorms or, or other, other weather events over time. And because we have such detailed records, we have records going back, well, it's not continual, we have a lot of gaps, but going back as far back as the 1740s, people have been recording this several times a day, and they're nearly continuous from the 18, 1813 13 onwards. So we can look at things like cold spell counts, and we can see there are years that had lots of cold spells, and we had years with more cold spells. We can see how things changed, not only over centuries, but even through decades. And we can look at heat waves and see how heat waves have changed also. So we can look at these things, not just over periods of decades and years and seasons, but we can even look at them. I mean, we have, we have a lot of data. So we can look at them even over things like, 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 like days, uh, if we want to. So there were some graphs there that had a lot of white space. And that white space was quite recent. It was sort of 1870s to 1950s. And that's not because the data is not there, it's because the data is not transcribed and machine readable. So the DRAW project, uh, which we started about five years ago, is a citizen science project to try and make machine readable and analyzable the data from the McGill Observatory. So here, this is what the McGill campus looked like uh, in about 1890, and you can see the McGill Observatory right there at the end. Uh, so the McGill Observatory was founded in 1864 by Charles Smallwood, who I mentioned a little bit earlier in the talk. Charles Smallwood died in 1873, and the McGill Observatory was then uh, taken over or run by uh, Clement McLeod from the Civil Engineering Department, who was Smallwood's student, and Small and McLeod's student. So McLeod there is the one in the top hat with the with his hands in the pockets, and this is a picture we all love because it shows they were about to go do some uh, surveying. So the observatory had, again, had other functions as well as the uh, just the weather observatory. Um, and uh, they, it looks very, very uh, late Victorian uh, in picture uh, of the, the observatory and the students. So the DRAW project is an online project. Uh, we are asking volunteers who we call citizen scientists or citizen archivists. It's an interdisciplinary project. So everyone, the archivists, the digital humanities, the meteorologists, the geographers, the coders, everyone brings their own angle to it. Um, we, so we ask volunteers to log on to our site. There's a brief tutorial and we ask them to transcribe for us uh, as best they can the observations that were taken between 1873 and 1950s of the McGill Observatory records. So, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought a bit there. Uh, so what we've done is we have scanned all the pages. There's about 10,000 pages, uh, which, so it's a lot of data because it's 70 odd years worth of data. Uh, and we put them up on the internet or we put them up on our app and they form the background page, uh, which looks a little bit like this. And then we've made a transcription tool to divide it up into micro tasks. And we asked them to transcribe anywhere between about three and six observations, which takes, depending, as, as you get more used to it, it takes less time, but it takes a few minutes. And save the observations by drawing a box around where they are on the page, so you know what you've already done and what you haven't done yet. And uh, we usually ask the observer, or the volunteer, if they can transcribe most of the page, but you can stop at any time. So it can take you a week or two weeks or more, as much time as you need to transcribe a page. And uh, just before Christmas, we had hit 2 million observations. So we got almost all the observations, well, not almost all the observations, but got an awful lot of observations done thanks to our wonderful, wonderful transcribers. But we we don't actually know how many trans how many observations we have to transcribe because some some pages are completely full, and some pages, depending on what error it was and how the observers felt that day, um, they didn't fill everything in. So 
So we we think we have maybe 4 million observations that transcribe, but we're not completely sure. Uh, and oh, I won't get into all the details about this, but uh, this uh, has been a wonderful project uh, to, to, to go through. And uh, I was talking before about hazardous events like snowstorms. One of the things we're looking at, and uh, some, some of our, our colleagues, uh, some teachers at uh, college, for example, that are, are interested in things like uh, ur urban hazards such as smoke. So on the left side there was a graph I was interested in looking at because I was trying to look at the number of smoke days in the period of the early observers, the Bethune and Skakel and the other, and McCord and the others, versus how many smoke days were recorded in the period of, well, in the more recent period from the Dor Dorval observations. And I was interested to see what was behind the smoke days. Was it things like forest fires or was it things like cold smoke that would be more prevalent on cold days when people would have wood fires or coal fires or in industrial smoke? And I think in the earlier period, it was mostly forest fires. Uh, so it was mostly connected with drought. But in the later period, I think it was more connected with heating and industrial smoke because it really drops off in the 1960s when uh, we started having hydropower. And so again, we have all this unknown in the middle because we didn't, at the time that I was, we were looking at this, we hadn't had enough observations typed in yet from the McGill Observatory from the DRAW project. So we've done a little micro analysis from 1874 to 1889 of the cloud types, because this is where smoke is usually recorded. And for this period, um, smoke is still very a very small amount. It's only 1% of the observations that we are seeing in cloud type. So it would be really interesting to see when, well, during what periods is do we see so much smoke in Montreal and what is it linked to and what kind of pollution hazards uh, are linked to these this hazardous event of smoke. Um, so this is a kind of information we can get. Uh, from from these records. And this is what we can get by transcribing the entire record, by transcribing not just things like temperature and precipitation, but also cloud, weather, wind, everything that's on the page. So, so far I've been discussing mostly the St. Lawrence Valley in Montreal, which is a smaller area of, of Canada. We've also partnered, uh, we, we also started a new uh, organization called Open Data Rescue in uh, early 2021. And we've partnered with Environment and Climate Change Canada to try and transcribe records across Canada. So this is uh, quite a, it's a similar project, but uh, also quite, quite uh, ambitious. Uh, so these are records that are so far have been located outside of Canada and archives outside of Canada, mainly in, the National Archives and Records Administration in the US, these are a lot of the records that were sent to Joseph Henry's Smithsonian Volunteer Network Observations. So a lot of them are from the mid 19th century, but we've also found some records in the UK uh, archives. So some of them go as far back as, uh, as, this, as the mid, uh, uh, mid 18th century. So we're hoping to go across the country. Uh, with these records. And here we have about 1.2 million observations that we've transcribed uh, with this project. And here's an example of what these records look like. So once again, they're, they're very data dense, um, although these also have a lot of weather descriptors. So they typically tend to be about three pages, including things like cloud direction, wind direction, uh, sometimes with the weather, but they also have something that's really interesting. They have a page that's called casual phenomena. And these can be anything from storm, uh, wind, to things like uh, in St. John's, for example, they had a lot of descriptions of the ice in the harbor. Sometimes they have river freezing up. In the prairies, they often have things like prairie fire. Uh, sometimes they have things like uh, first, first harvest or first, or, or things like that. So they have a lot of other, uh, descriptions, which can be things like natural hazards, but can also be things like um, uh, ph uh, phenomenological data. And sometimes it is just weather data. A lot of it is aurora, which is interesting because it gets us back to that idea of magnetical observations and how magnetical observations can be related to weather observations. Uh, 
So I took this example for July 1872 because here's some very, very preliminary analysis because we are still transcribing. We have a deadline due this Friday. So we are transcribing and analyzing uh, a little bit uh, still this week because it shows a little bit the just the, the, the ordinary day-to-day -day variability that we see in these weather records. So here we see uh, June and July, and we can see how the, the temperature goes from below 10 in the summer to above 30 within a space of a few days. Uh, and this happens repeatedly. You have these repeated waves of cold and heat coming across the prairies in July, 1872. And then in November, 1872, you have the temperature going from above zero down to uh, minus 20, and then down to below minus 30 before the end of the month in December. And then it goes up again to above zero. And then by Christmas time, it's below minus 40. So you have these, these waves of um, temperature extremes within the space of a few days uh, coming, coming across the prairies here. So we're not the only ones who are working on this. There are groups working on transcribing and analyzing historical data across the world. Uh, so as well as looking at what the, the data look like locally, which is mostly what I've been showing you throughout this talk, we try to look, we try to see what the data looks like globally. So a lot of the information is sent to international databases, such as the International Surface Pressure Data. This happens every time, I don't know. Surface databases. And what uh, people in the, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration do, the NOAA team in Colorado, is they take all the, the information, most of the pressure information, and they run it through a numerical weather prediction model, except instead of predicting what the weather is going to be like tomorrow or next week, they predict what the weather is going to be in 1850 using all this historical data. And then they, they bring out these global fields, global so they call it reanalysis data because they're not analyzing for the future, they're reanalyzing for the past. So here's an example uh, for, uh, of the pressure fields for the Galveston hurricane in 1900 which was a devastating hurricane in the Caribbean area and Louisiana where between, they don't actually know how many people were killed, but somewhere between the estimates are somewhere between 8,000 and 12,000. So by looking at the weather patterns and looking what, what happened there, again, it's the idea is to try and look at vulnerabilities and resiliences and see what the weather patterns were and how we can see, does that happen? Does that repeat? If it repeats, what, what has changed so that we can save lives today? And so this is this is actually a very old video. It dates from about 2015, I think. And it, it, again, it's another video that was produced by Philip Rohan at the UK, UK Met office. And it again, it's similar. It's based on the reanalysis data, and it puts together. Uh, it, it makes a sort of weather video of older data. So this is a weather video from 1880, and uh, I don't know if any of you uh, know about the winter of 1880, but it was a brutal, brutal winter. Anybody who knows The Little House on the Prairie or the, the book series, there's an entire book dedicated to this winter uh, there because it was just a snowstorm after snowstorm that swept across North America out to the North Atlantic and then hit Europe as a series of gales. So it was a, a terrible winter. So here the black bands represent bands of precipitation. The little arrows represent wind direction. The yellow dots are um, stations, and you'll notice over the oceans, there are some yellow dots that move. That's because they're ships. So these are observations that were taken from ships, and you'll see them move around, around the, the Arctic. And th this light gray area is what's known as the fog of ignorance. So this is where there was no data in 2015, and since then, there's a lot of work that's been done. So there is more information now from there, including people who have taken ships logs from the Arctic, from the Pacific, and work that's been done over Alaska and Canada, as we saw earlier. So I'll just play this, this video. And again, this is, this is the kind of work uh, that's being done through international collaborations to get this kind of information. 
So I was asked the question recently of why climate memory is important because well, this is an audience of historians, so I don't really need to explain it to you, but a lot of people sort of say, well, why should we put money into this? And, and uh, it it's quite, takes quite a lot of convincing to, to say that this is an important field. So one of the, the, the themes, I suppose, of this talk, uh, or that I, I try to, the, something I'm, I'm trying to, to say, I guess, to, to, to audiences, is that Canada has a longer history of meteorology and climatology than is often realized. We often think that climate, climate change, that it's something new, that it's something that is just this generation, uh, that we've only been thinking about it for a few years. I mean, sometimes I get comments on, on blogs or things like that, it's like, well, we, we already know what the problem is. It's time to stop research. We don't need to put research into climate anymore. We need to have action we, uh, or, or, or things like climate is an infant science. Well, McCord was saying climate was an infant science in the 17, I'm sorry, in the 1840s. If we had kept on with the work that he started and the others started and Gautier started, well, we wouldn't be an infant science in, in well, now. Uh, so we've been saying that it's an infant science for 200 years. And thinking about climate change has been around for a very long time. And I've just presented uh, a snippet here, but there are other historians who have been writing about this and writing about uh, the history of climate about the thinking of climate change in much greater de detail than I've presented here in a couple of slides. But, but yes, it's the, the idea of climate change and the idea of human-induced climate change through different mechanisms has been around, uh, especially in the new world for almost uh, since the beginning of colonization. So it's not a new idea, but we keep forgetting about it. We, we keep, it keeps coming, there's an investigation about it, and then it falls out of fashion and we keep forgetting. Uh, so that, that in itself is interesting. Why does this keep recurring? Why, why do we keep investigating it and then forgetting about it and then investigating and forgetting? Um, why, why, do, why are we always surprised when we find this again? Um, context. Context can help establish trust in data. When we see that these are not a bunch of people in the backwoods of Canada scribbling on a log cabin desk or something like that, taking observations from a wonky thermometer in a, a clearing or something. But no, these are people who are, it doesn't have to be people who are connected to the establishment. You can also get very good observations from somebody who is sitting in a wonky log cabin in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't mean that because they're connected to the establishment, their observations are better than someone else. But it does mean that Canada was not uh, an isolated place. Canada was integrated into the scientific establishments of their time. And these people were interested. So it because they were interested, they sought out other people who were also interested and they formed their own networks and they wrote letters and they, they wrote letters to people in the field saying, how do I do this? Can you send me better thermometers? Here are my observations. What do you suggest? Um, and you need to, it's a bit of a catch 22 because it takes a lot of energy and effort to transcribe the observations. You need to transcribe the observations before you found out if they're any good. But there are ways that you can look at the observations and you can sort of look at the context and say, was this person interested enough to write to other people? Was this person interested enough to, um, to, to, to find out more about how to take good observations? It doesn't guarantee anything. It doesn't guarantee that the observations are good, but you can look at the context and you can see, well, these are people who are connected. These are people who looked for instructions. These are people who asked for instructions and it can help you say, okay, well, I'll have a look at these. I'll see what they're like. And as I said, it doesn't guarantee anything. Some of the most connected people actually took really bad observations. So it, it's not a guarantee, but it's something that we can see that Canada and Canadians were part of both national and international. They were taking this seriously. And then the historical records can be really reveal, sorry, surprises in the story that we think we know about climate evolution. I was not expecting to find 
1742, the middle of the Little Ice Age, that there were droughts so severe that all the streams dried up and the cattle died of thirst. I was not expecting to find that 1807 and 1808 were the warmest uh, summers on the record. I was not expecting to find these cold winters in the 17, in the 18, oh, sorry, getting all mixed up. I was not expecting to find these cold, cold snaps and cold winters in the 1980s. Um, so we, we sort of think of the past based on these pictures and postcards uh, and things like that. And then we find that there's actually more variability. And then we can, we can learn from that because if we know that this happened in the past, if we know that our climate is capable of doing this, then we know we have to be prepared for that. And that can help us learn about both vulnerability and also resilience. If, this, if people had this kind of climate and then they adapted to it, how did they adapt to it? How can we adapt to it? How can we adapt to climate change? Um, knowing how people in the past adapted to climate change and how can we mitigate climate change? What did people do in the past and how can we take those lessons and apply them to the future so that we can become less vulnerable uh, also? So thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, to, especially to Joanna for all her hard work in inviting me and uh, for being here. Uh, I want to thank especially all the citizen scientists and transcribers, uh, because without all their work, we would not have this data to analyze in the first place. Uh, and to thank uh, the many people who worked with me on all these projects. Thank you. Before I start with all my questions, does anybody want to show me the set sign? And there may be some questions coming in from the Zoom as well, if there are in the floor. But first of all, are there any in the Zoom? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, just uh, please wait for the microphone. Uh, oh. There are people online that are visible. Uh, Sorry about that. Thank, thank you very much for a most interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering when you look on the long term trends, McGill, for example, is was obviously pretty uh, out in the sticks in the early days. And it, uh, the, the urban heat island has, uh, has grown significantly over that period. There are also questions, I guess, about the representativeness of early observations, where they were taken. Was there a microclimatic effect? Um, are you able to sort these sorts of things out in your analysis? Um, so the... The ones I showed with the long-term trends, those were actually built through regression analysis. So they were the observations were regressed onto the modern day observations. So most of the microclimatic effects and trend effects should have been taken into account too in the regression analysis. But it's really quite interesting, the, the urban heat island effect, because I did some analysis on that back in well, be, well, a little bit before I started the, that particular analysis, because um, I call it the St. Lawrence Valley series, because, of course, all of these are, many of these are fragmentary. So in order to make them meld into one series, you can't just sort of take them as they are and, and patch them together because they're coming from different series, different places, different time periods. So they need to be melded together statistically. But in, in terms of the urban heat island effect, it was really quite interesting because I, I, I did a, a number of analyses on that and I would have expected to find sort of jumps and changes. Like as the heat island grew, I would have expected to sort of find, well, there's a change and then maybe there's, there's another slope and maybe there's more, maybe a period of stability. And then when comparing to either stations, like other urban stations, which were more, more rural and then became urbanized themselves or compared to um, uh, ur uh, less urban stations. But even less urban stations or country stations, they, they themselves can be micro affected by microclimates because, because those, those areas change too. So it becomes a real, a real headache. But when I looked at it, I was really quite surprised because there's definitely a heat urban, uh, urban heat island effect because 
the McGill station, for example, was warmer than uh, suburban airports or other stations, but it, there was very little trend, which I did not expect to find. So I think, I don't really know. I think part of it might be because McGill is actually in a, a sort of park. It's right on the edge of Mount Royal and it, it's in it itself is in the campus. So I, and if you look at radiance uh, diagrams, surface skin temperatures from uh, overhead aircraft or even satellites, you can see Sherbrooke Street. You can see that there's like a 30 degree difference from one side of the street to the other. So that could be part of it, that, that the McGill station was itself in a sort of urban park. Uh, I have a, a friend who's actually doing a lot of micro uh, sighting right now. He's doing a lot of experiments with thermometers placed around the city and around McGill campus and things like that to look at microclimate effects that way. Um, and then otherwise, as I said, I was looking at those frequency diagrams and I was matching the, especially the extremes, because that's where you see the urban heat island effect, especially in the extremes. And that's where I was expecting to find a lot more of the differences which I didn't really. There were some differences with Smallwood because Smallwood was out in Laval, which is north of Montreal. Um, so I didn't use his in the compilation because that one I felt was, was not as representative. So we have a couple of questions um, from the online uh, chat. The first comes from Laura Mat uh, Matakoro. Um, who would like to first thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, she's curious about the relationship between religion and science and how people explained changes in climate. Is there any evidence of religious influence slash thinking? Uh, she seems to recall that Smallwood had to choose between the School of Divin Divinity and his position as the first meteorologist at McGill. No, it wasn't divinity, it was medicine. So he was offered the position of Dean of, Medi uh, dean of Medicine at Bishop's University. Uh, and he turned that down to become, to found the observatory. So that was quite interesting that he, uh, he was uh, turned down this prestigious position as a, as a physician or as a Dean of Medicine. Uh, but he had no hesitation. He was, he was already offered the position. He was ready to go. Um, and he had been appointed. And then the funding for the observatory came through and he said, oh, no, I got my observatory and he took it. Uh, so he had absolutely no hesitation in turning down the position of Dean uh, at Bishop's University to found the observatory. Um, but yeah, no, uh, religion was, uh, was for many of the observers uh, an inspiring factor. Uh, as we saw, many of them were uh, clergymen and they, not many of them said it directly, and there's only a few for which uh, we, we have personal notes, but some of them, Lefroy, for example, found it to be, found it was quite religious, uh, and he found it to be um, part of his religious, I don't know if I want to say religious duty exactly, but a lot of them found that it was part of their religious makeup, I suppose. To, so, so some of it comes under the guise of, I think it was um, Kepler who originally said uh, the book, uh, there were two books, uh, two of God's books. There was the Bible and there was the book of nature. So, or maybe it was Galileo, it was either Kepler or Galileo. Um, and so uh, looking into nature and studying nature was um, thinking God's thoughts after him. So for them, uh, exploring nature and keeping these records and understanding nature was part of their religion because it was understanding um, God's handiwork. And the second question comes from Lisa Dillon, um, who would like to ask you about the link between or if you could speak to the link between climate and health by scientists at the time. Uh, yeah, okay, that's, that's an I have an entire book chapter on that. So uh, let's see how much. Um, so uh, in Gauthier's time, it was considered neo-Hippocratic. So, uh, so it originally goes back to the ancient Greeks. And there, well, there were sort of two strands of thoughts at that point in time. And that was that 
um, whether influences health. So, it could, you know, it, it's a little fuzzy in my mind because it's not, we, we live in this sort of, it's a little bit hard for us to understand because we live post pester So we understand microbiology, we understand. So to get into this mindset, it's a bit like trying to understand phlogiston, you know, because we live um, in, in a calorie theory. So I'll try to explain it, but I have to under, admit, I don't quite wrap my head around it. So so even things like wind direction, like, like certain winds brought certain illnesses. And it's even the sort of way that, you know, your mother, your grandmother tells you to wrap up warm or you'll catch a cold and things like that. Um, so there were certain, there are certain weathers and certain winds which brought ill health. And, and there is actually a certain truth to it. I mean, I mean when you have certain drops in pressure can bring on arthritic pains. And, and so it's not, completely un maybe it's not completely unfounded I mean these people were not stupid but um so so Gaultier would always have a little summary at the end of his his reports or his monthly report saying this is what the weather was and this is what the the, the illnesses were and so because it was a certain type of weather there were more pneumonias or there were more agues or things like that and and again it, it's not stupid because if you have high temperatures and you have bacteria multiplying, or if you have, um, if you have poor harvest, then you're going to have famine and you're going to have, or, or not even poor harvest, but if you have rust in your wheat, then people will be sick because you're eating bad food. So, um, so if you think of the conditions people were living in, these are not silly ideas. Uh, and if you can't heat your house, then you're going to be more immunologically vulnerable. Um, so, so there were some connections. So those were the the connections uh, in that period. In the 19th century, uh, we had infectious with the the um, increased commerce and with the cholera, which started in the what 1830s. Well, there's some theories even that it started after Tambora. So we had the cholera sweeping the world. And so, so we had infectious diseases sweeping the world and increased shipping and increased communication and increased, uh, well, movement of people. So there was cholera, there was typhus, there were all these infectious diseases sweeping the world. And it was before Pasteur. So it was before the microbiological theories. And again, uh, in, warm, in warm conditions, you have increased proliferation of bacteria. You didn't have refrigeration. You didn't have a lot of the, those sort of things we take for granted today. So it makes sense that in certain weathers, you have certain increased diseases. There was no um, indoor sanitation. The, the streets were open sewers. Uh, so a lot of doctors were interested in looking at the connection between weather and health. And, and a lot of these old publications, you would have the weather table and then you'd have the table of mortality all printed on the same page. Uh, so they were trying to find what these connections were. And Smallwood, interestingly, he was very interested in ozone because they thought ozone was a disinfectant. So especially during some of the cholera epidemics, he would be measuring ozone and trying to find out if ozone, during periods when there was high ozone in the atmosphere, if that helped disinfect the atmosphere and have fewer uh, deaths of cholera. He'd be measuring ozone all over the place in vegetable patches and sick rooms uh, in the streets. Uh, to try and see if ozone acted uh, as a bleach, as a disinfectant. And there was a, sorry. Anyway, so yes, so there, was, there were a lot of connections uh, at the time between uh, medicine and meteorology. So there were a lot of doctors who took med medical records. And in, in France, even, the doctors were mandated uh, in the 1780s, 1790s, they were mandated to take weather observations. Uh, yeah, we, we have a second question from uh, Laura, um, who would like to know if there was an increase in crow population in the city of Montreal as temperatures rose. Uh, that I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I have not seen any records uh, mentioning any increase in crow population. Short answer. <laughs> 
it's about your citizen science and your trust in data. So it's interesting because there was citizen science in the past, like people who were sending stuff and now you're using it. And I'd like you to tell us a bit about how you conceive of that project and the democratic part of that and the maybe uh, having people participate in your project as a way to acquaint people with science. And if you have some mission that way and how you're thinking about all these people participating in your project. Uh, well, part of it is to try and have outreach. So on our, our website, we uh, we try to have a blog. Well, we have a, it depends on how much um, time and effort and funding we have. So it sort of goes up and down a little bit. But yes, uh, so, so part of what we're trying to do is also have a, a sort of blog and outreach and to tell people about um, about the science of the past and who these people were and who how people took measurements so so part of it is um is to have on the same site where people come to take observations information uh education we have a site also for for educators where where we can say okay you can go on this part and here's newspaper article here are newspaper articles here's information that you can use to have in your class we have some curricula that are up there um so we're trying to make it uh available for people to use and information that people can use and we're also well a little bit the pandemic happened and it, we couldn't go and do as much outreach as we, we were hoping to but yes uh so so we're and we're trying to make people we're trying to converge a little bit the two projects um so but we have been spending a lot of time actually transcribing because we have the work with environment canada but we're hoping to have more um outreach work also with the, the smithsonian volunteers to be able to say well these are who the people were um this is what and maybe one of the things we were hoping to do but we haven't done yet is to be able to make links with the community ah here this is this is something that happened in your community in the past um this, these are weather observations from your area from your local area um and so, so we have different ideas of how to make this accessible and open, um, but we don't have a large staff. <laughs> so our ideas are outpacing our ability sometimes. But yes, uh, we, we actually wrote a paper not long ago uh, that talks about uh, this in four quadrants. So we sort of have the past and the present and the observers and the observations, and we're trying to make those connections sort of like, so in the past you have the observers and they were volunteers. And then we have the citizen scientists and how do we make, so we have things like communication. So in the past we had communication through letters, now we have communication through blogs. And in the past we had the, the, the means were the instruments and now the means are the computer. So we're trying to sort of map that out. Um, in, uh, so we wrote a paper about trust and how we can measure trust and how we trust the citizen scientists today and how we trust the observations. Um, so we're, we're trying to explore those issues. Thank you so much. And um, can you start out with that? <laughs> That in my paper, the only thing I'm doing is talking about a historical point of view about Pluto. And the reason why I was coming to Australia to talk about Pluto where I was in the night. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. Okay, I won't say all of that again except to welcome everybody to come back for the future talks in this series of three climate histories. Um, and thank you, Victoria, for getting us off to such a good start. Thanks. Oh, thank you. <laughs>